So, of course, uh, I think that automatically implies symmetric, right? And um, D transpose A D. So it happens if D <coughs> is a vector, non zero vector that happens to have this uh, property that D transpose A D is zero, then A D is zero. Of course, you can just divide by D transpose and get the result, no? or not. So what does this mean? This, this basically means that D is an eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue zero. zero, right? So how can we get from this relation the fact that D is an eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue zero? Well this would be, this would be really easy if A were diagonal because if A is diagonal, it just consists of eigenvalues on the diagonal, right? And zero is an eigenvalue, right? Semi-positive definite. If zero were not an eigenvalue, it would be positive definite, so this could never happen, right? So it means that if A is diagonal, some, some diagonal has have zeros on the, right? There's, zero is an eigenvalue. And it may appear in, I don't know, in three multiplicity three, so it may, there may be not one, but two or three, right? Then when we multiply to the left and to the right, a diagonal matrix, what happens? You basically get that quadratic terms where the components of D get squared and they get multiplied also with the, the eigenvalues, right? So that Again, only if if A were diagonal, then it would be lambda 1, lambda n, and D transpose AD were lambda 1, D1 squared, plus lambda 2, D2 squared, plus lambda n, D n squared, right? Lambdas are non-negative, so this quantity, how can this quantity be zero? Hmm? If, let's say lambda one is zero, so lambda two equals lambda five equals zero. Let's say the first, you know, there are, there are five zeros appearing on the diagonal. Right? This means that D transpose AD is zero only when D6, DN, so the rest have to be zero, the Ds, right? Because lambda, lambda six, and lambda n are all positive, right? So we've kind of grouped all the ones that are zero, start with a zero, and then everything else is positive. So this means that the, the only components of D that are non-zero are the one corresponding to the zero eigenvalue, right? So this means that D is This basically means that um, AD, which which is lambda one d one plus lambda n d n, is zero because if lambda is zero, or or if lambda is not zero, then these are zero. Right? But basically, it means that the D is is an eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda equals zero. Okay. What if A is not diagonal? Right. 
Well, it can be diagonalized. So you can write this as as um, in this form a diagonal matrix or consisting of eigenvalues on the diagonal of A and an invertible matrix Q right and as I said you can actually make it in a what's called orthogonal fashion so because for a symmetric matrix the eigenvectors are orthogonal eigenvectors correspond to distinct eigenvalues so you can actually make an orthogonal transformation so you can and this is just needed for the following reason so if, if now I have D transpose A D equals 0 this is D transpose Q transpose D Q right this is A but now I can write this as Q transpose uh, Q D transpose D Q D and now from the what we said earlier this implies that D Q right so it's like we, do, we, we ignore this anymore. This is zero. So this basically means that Q inverse D Q D equals zero, which means A D equals zero. Huh? There is a better yet way to see this. Actually, I was hoping that you could um, do it that way because you know forget diagonalization and all that just how can we infer that this implies a d equals zero if we use the minimization uh, of the quadratic form Remember, f of x, x transpose ax, has minimum, right? It's a it's a convex functional a function. No, we're talking back in final dimension. It's a convex function, so it has a minimum when the gradient is zero. What was the gradient of f? AX, right? Well, if D is such that D transpose AD is zero, this means that this is the minimum, right? This means that f of d, which is d transpose a d, is less than or equal to n x, which is f of x for all x, because x because a was semi-positive definite. So this this quantity for any x, it's at least zero, right? So if this is zero, this means d is a minimizer. So the gradient has to be zero. And the gradient is just AD. Okay? It's a much better way. Um, even better, well, that's not, okay, that's, I think that's pretty equivalent to this, but uh, it's to remember what was the cat, um, the property of the eigenvalue, of the zero eigenvalue. The smallest eigenvalue is. The minimum 
eigenvalue, right? Which in our case is zero, because it's a semi-positive definite, is the minimum of what? X transpose AX over, well, X transpose AX over X equal to one, right? That was the, if you minimize this on this on this uh, constraint on this restricted set, you get the lambda. Well, I shouldn't call it minimum lambda. I should call lambda minimum. Right. So if you consider the minimization with this constraint then again the minimum the, the minimum is going to be achieved at an eigenvector corresponding to the minimum eigenvalue that was uh, in the exam midterm i think this minimization with a constraint has optimal solution X star, which corresponds to, which is an eigenvector corresponding to the minimum eigenvalue, and zero is the minimum eigenvalue. So, <clears throat> uh, let's see. Anyway, it was just more like a curiosity, but. Um, So let's see, what, uh, what do we do today? So today what I'd like to do is kind of finish up this um, chapter 5 and get started on chapter 6, optimal uh, control. Uh, we have just three more meetings, so um, I'm thinking of uh, structuring the final exam as a take-home that I would give you on Friday and uh, have it back on Monday. Um, of course, that's going to ru ruin your weekend, but it's ruined anyway, right? <laughs> um, does this sound, sound like a good plan? Okay. Um, no class Monday, no. Um, Let's see. Um, so that's that's one thing. Um, I have the homework that's going to be due Friday. So homework number set, number eight, and that's going to be the last one due Friday. And final exam is due Monday. Okay. No, no, it's going to be uh, from this, uh, from where the midterm uh, ended. So it will. So the the, uh, the final will have um, sort of the conjugate gradient method and variational problems and as much as we can do on the, on the optimal control. Um, yeah, so the reason why I want to do take home is I wanted to actually use the computer a little bit in some of this problem, so uh, rather than um, theoretical only. I mean, there, you, could, you could ask to set the variational problems um, I mean, there will be some, some uh, for the variational problems, there will be some of this minimization where you have to write all the Lagrange, you know, and, and um, try to do as much by hand. But um, there will be, I guess, one problem on the conjugate gradient method, and um, that you can do anything by hand. And um, some of the optimal control problems. So, uh, what I'd like to do today is is um, 
is do uh, um, a little bit of numerical approximation for uh, variational problems. And um, then start um, optimal control. So first of all, I want to remind you that we're not talking about minimizing uh, quantities that depend on paths rather than on finitely many variables. So u is now I'm still talking about 1D, uh, the variable x or the um, the independent variable. So it's one-dimensional, and u may be several-dimensional, but you know, um, it's basically going to be a path in this space, uh, whatever dimension u is. And what are the usual, uh, the normal uh, admissible admissible paths? How do you define to be admissible? Well, some sometimes you restrict to a fixed left endpoint. Sometimes you restrict to a uh, um, uh, right endpoint. But sometimes you don't. You kind of leave it free. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of adopt what the book uses, put in parentheses. So this may or may not be uh, present. If they're not present, if, um, for example, u of a is a and u of b is free, then uh, the natural boundary condition f with respect to the u prime uh, component at uh, this point b u of b u prime of b is set to be zero. Okay, and this is called transverse transversality condition or natural boundary condition. Um, I won't go into, you know, why is it called transversality and what is uh, F? F is really the integrant It appears, and for now, I think for forever, we'll just use uh, uh, that depends on is the first order in U that appears in the integrand. Okay, so let's just write what the order Lagrange equations say that um, well, it's F with respect to the second component that's where the place you where you put u minus the derivative with respect to x f at u prime right at x u of x u prime of x and in addition to this and appropriate boundary conditions. All right, so um, the example we had was, well, we kind of talked about it um, last time was minimal surface between two um, two circles. So surface of revolution, you minimize this over let me let me take it for simplicity. 
Um, yeah, let me take it from 0 to 1. So just from 0 to 1, and we, we look for functions that are positive that minimize this expression, right? And we said that um, So from the Euler Lagrange equation, we get u of x to be a constant cosine hyperbolic of x over another constant plus some shift. Well, shift is not really d, but it would be d times c. Okay. And we get that. I mean, the picture looks like this. So it's it's one at one. I'm just going to, well, one is like here, so. And it looks like a cosine hyperbolic that's shifted, right? Again, I, I pick the one and one so that it's symmetric, so you can see the uh, minimum of this which is this value C, cosine hyperbolic is, is like this and, and at zero is one. Okay, so at the minimum, where cosine hyperbolic is minimum, this um, U has to be equal to C, so that's the minimum here. And um, And anyway, d is, is, is clearly going to be, so c times d is going to be minus a half, right? Why is this? Because x plus cd means the shift is to the left, right, whatever, with, with, uh, with, um, with that much from zero. So otherwise, it would be kind of centered at the... Uh, symmetric about the, the uh, u-axis, okay? But being shifted like this, you know, it's it's a half because again, we're picking um, the height to be the same one. Okay, so the minimum is is halfway in between. Okay, so this is like C cosine hyperbolic of X plus C D over C. Okay. So model of this shift, it's basically a constant cosine hyperbolic of the variable over C. And you find C by imposing to find C, you say U of zero equals 1, for instance, and that gives you c equals cosine hyperbolic, c cosine hyperbolic of d equals 1, so c is 1 over cosine hyperbolic of d. Okay? And um, you, you basically get these two, two things here. And either you solve for d and you plug in here, or you solve for, or you plug this c in there, uh, you would get that, whichever. Um, let's plug in c. So you'd get d over cosine hyperbolic of d equals negative a half. Okay? Now, the, the question is, does this have a solution? And uh, if you plot cosine hyperbolic, d over cosine hyperbolic of d, um,
let's see, remember I said d, uh, cosine hyperbolic goes to infinity really fast, right? So this is going to go to zero at infinity. It's zero, zero, and it's odd, so it will look like this. Okay? So the, the question is, where is the peak? Well, the peak, I think, it's happens at 0 0.66, 6 something. Uh, not 66, 63. That's a good, actually, one variable minimization minimization problem. You can you can uh, kind of use the computer to kind of figure this out symbolically or numerically. I think symbolically is okay. You can do that symbolically. Uh, So what what does this say? It says that negative a half has a solution, right? That being negative a half has a solution because zero point five. Okay. But if, for instance, the two circles would be farther away than not one but like twice this, then the minimum always occurs in the middle, in the halfway in between, right? So for instance, what's the double of this? 1.2, 1 1.3, okay, whatever, right? So if for instance, the two, the two circles are 1.5 apart, this means, this means, and they are the same height. This means halfway in between is one, uh, 0 0.75, and that doesn't have a solution, right? So this, you cannot find D, and therefore you cannot find C. So that this uh, catenary, uh, this this cosine hyperbolic, can go through those two points if they're so if they're far apart enough, far apart, right? Um, so what I'd like to do is um, plot this sort of solution, but not 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 knowing the, uh, I mean, of course you can do, if you did it by hand, you can, you can plot cosine hyperbolic, you know, with this approximal value of D, right? Um, but what I li I'd like to show you how to do it numerically. How do you actually do this numerically? So how do you start from um, a minimization problem? And this one is unconstrained minimization, right? How can you discretize and actually ask the computer to actually find the minimum? It's kind of interesting. Um, because it, 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 when you discretize a continuous problem, what happens? You decide, oh, I'm going to use 100 discretization points, right? So I'm going to use 100 values, I mean the value of that path at 100 points. So you're going to end up minimizing a problem that is with 100 variables. Okay. So if, you, if you've ever asked, um, why do we ever do simplex, for instance, method for more than four or five you know, variables, well, that's a perfect, I mean, this is not really the simplex method, but it's a nonlinear optimization problem, but it's, it requires not a hundred, not only a hundred, but a thousand, a million, right? The, the more, the more, uh, the better you want to approximate the continuous problem with a discrete problem, the more discretization points you have to take. So it's going to be in a bigger and bigger dimension, this nonlinear optimization problems. Um, so I posted this some codes here. Just just a second, I'll get there. Um, in the codes, well, the first one is just this. Um, it's really quick. Let me let me just save all of them. 
So I'm not using any symbolic. I mean, if you have symbolic, that's that's okay. Um, I heard that it's actually going going away. The symbolic uh, capability of MATLAB, they switched to something else. It's not going away. It's not going away. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, it's just uh, don't panic. But um, okay, so let me open. Um, the stretching surface, this code is kind of uh, amateurish. I'm not, uh, I haven't spent too much time, but um, it's basically I'm, I, I want to plot uh, symbolic, not symbolic, yes, well, almost symbolic, not symbolically, but um, I'm going to plot this expression which, you know, simplifies when B is 1 and capital B is also 1. Um, and just point out there is a command called cylinder that if you specify like the curve u, the path u, then it's going to rotate around the axis that you want. So that's that's cosine hyperbolic of t over c plus d, right? C times that. So that's that's the code. That's uh, let me see what comes up. Okay, Sims, I want to get rid of that. And there was some. Um, so it's really, it's really, the viewpoint is a little bit different than what you, why is it not moving? Okay. Um, the viewpoint is a little bit different, so that's, I think to see it the way we, we kind of like to see it is this way. Um, oh yeah, okay. I see. So I have the pause in the code, which is not greatest thing, but, okay, let me do it again. the fact that it's uh, upside down yes or no <laughs> okay so it goes just like that right so so it's upside down but you know that's the two circles and of course that's the catenary, the curve, the cosine hyperbolic. Um, so what I, what you can do is actually um, stretch that, basically place the circle at a slightly bigger point uh, than one. Um, and I think here it's just plotted that, that D, so that's basically the, um, not the D, the, um, the location of the minimum, it's not D. Okay, that's the location of the minimum. Um, and you can see that it goes, as you stretch the, I mean, as you, as you make it farther apart, the, um, the surface becomes narrower in the middle. And when, it, when that quantity you now exceeds that maximum of, of D over cosine hyperbolic of D, that's when you no longer have a solution. So it's kind of, it's a little bit counterintuitive that the surface doesn't just shrink all the way until it gets to a point, you know. But physically what happens is as you, as you shrink to get to a certain value, whatever that thickness you compute to be, then past that 
that uh, critical point, what happens? You don't have a critical. You don't have a. You don't have an optimal. You know. You don't have a minimum uh, surface of that shape, right? In fact, the minimum surface will end up being the uh, surface area of the two circles. But um, anyway, I, I don't have a good way of stopping this code, so I'm sorry for that. But um, anyway, that's just that's that wasn't the main thing I wanted to show. Um, I want to go to this minimal surface discrete. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how to discretize these problems. And um, the idea is to do the following. Um, well, the code is really easy. Is basically that's the, all, all the code. So let me talk about that. Um, I'd like to choose a certain number of discretization points. So in this, you know, the code will will accept anything. Let's say 20. And so let me let me for now go back to. Well, what happened here? Okay, so. How to discretize? How can we discretize? Um, you know the the variational problem from zero to one, u of x squared of one plus u prime of x squared dx. U of zero is one. U of one is one. Well, the idea is discretize the interval. First of all, just partition the interval 0, 1 into n subintervals. And they should really be of, of equal length. equal to 1 over n, and uh, see, n or n plus 1. Okay. Into n plus 1 subintervals. So let's see. <coughs> 0 here, 1. So it's just a little bit off, because what you'd like to do is you'd like to introduce um, x1, x2, xn. Okay. What you'd like to do is um, we're going to consider the value of this, of this function u only on the interior points of the partition. Because at the endpoints, they're set to be 0, and, I mean 1 and 1, right? But of course, x0 is the, this, and xn plus 1 is this. So um, you have x, j, x, j plus 1, j from 0 to n. Okay? And they're equally uh, distant, so you know, we can figure what, what x, j is, but that, that's less important. Okay, next. So then define u. Um, of j to be given a path, just take the value at this xj and call it uj, right? Okay. So we obtain a discrete version of the variational problem, which says minimizing over uh, all possible u1, u2, 
un of some I don't know, the book likes to call um, T, but let me, let me keep the notation I. So what is this expression that we want to minimize? Well, the expression has to come from the discretization of this integral, right? Now, you can, you can discretize an integral using, you know, just, just Riemann sums, the usual Riemann sums. Or you can use uh, an approximation of the trapezoidal rule, and so forth. Um, let me try to just use Riemann sums. So integral from zero to one of a function f of x dx is we said this is a summation of f of x. j xj plus 1 minus xj and this could be any star right so any any intermediate point in between xj xj plus 1 f evaluated there j from 0 to n yep it's just three months I mean it's not equal, it's approximately equal to, right? So, if we, for instance, pick the midpoint, so, well, let's say xij is the midpoint. So xj is xj plus xj plus 1 over 2. Then it's going to be the summation of j from 0 to n f of xj plus xj plus 1. And this is 1 over n plus 1. The length is 1 over n plus 1. Okay. Okay, so turns out that you don't necessarily wanna when you discretize this integral, you don't just use the midpoint rule because then you'd have to evaluate the derivative at the min midpoint of that um Subinterval x i x i x j x j plus one, right? But actually, what you can do is then actually do a combination of um, so discretize this the term in u, the, the, the all the factors where u appear use this uh, midpoint expression, and well, actually, it's, it's not a midpoint; it's a trapezoid. It's more like a trapezoid rule. Um, and this discretize u prime as follows. Delta u over delta x. So this is going to be u of x j plus 1 minus u of x j over x j plus 1 minus x j. So this ends up being uj plus 1 minus uj over 1 over n plus 1. So it's n plus 1, uj plus 1 minus uj. Okay, so I shouldn't have said uh, the midpoint rule here, but you know, just just an, as an example, I think the better one is the trapezoid rule. So, using the trapezoid rule, you can um, 
show the following. So u prime u of x, the square root of 1 plus u prime squared, is approximately equal to a summation from 0 to n of uj plus 1 over uj divided by 2 square root of 1 plus and now this guy square n plus 1 squared uj plus 1 minus uj squared and dx is 1 over n plus 1 so I'm just going to squeeze it here but Okay, so this expression is kind of complicated looking, but it only depends on u1, u2. So this depends on u1, u2, un. and not on u0 and un plus 1 because those are set to be you know 1 and uh, well in this case 1 and 1 on both ends okay now imagine kind of taking n to be 20 and writing this as a objective function to be minimized over u1 through u20 let's say without any constraints you would actually have to compute the gradient and set it equal to zero and see where the gradient is is, um, is zero, right? In theory. In practice, though, it's kind of hectic. So, nevertheless, you've replaced or you've approximated the variational problem with the following minimizing this expression which is summation of well of these terms subject uh, over u un in rn And now let's, we don't, we don't even know if this is actually convex, but let's say um, if the functional in the continuous case was convex, there's a chance that this is convex. But let's say we just find a, a minimum, an optimal solution. If this has an optimal solution, right, so this is unconstrained, nonlinear optimization. the optimal u would, the, would then be is where the gradient equals to zero, right? So how do you actually ask a computer to do this? Well, I think in principle you could actually take the expression here, um, compute the gradient, and kind of code the gradient in a separate function if you'd like or whatever, and then try to solve it. Right? But that's first of all, this that implementation would actually require that. Uh, it's it's independent of n, so you you just change n, and it just works with a new n value, right? And you know even though the gradient probably you can compute the gradient for each u i j uh, u u j, um, it won't look pretty, and it, and in the implementation of this will, will actually be difficult. Um, I don't know if this reminds you a little bit of a homework problem early on where we had. Um, I'll, I'll show you that 
I remind you of that problem, but it was sort of um, um, the solution by hand. It was giving you that uh, uh, sort of recursion relation. So if you wanted to solve by hand, it was it was really difficult because you know setting a grade n equal to zero, you know, would probably give you u j in terms of u j plus one and u j minus one, right? Because that's that's how things appear, especially in this expression, right? So it it is kind of difficult. Um, well, what turns out MATLAB and and most most uh, sort of problems, mo most uh, computer algebra systems have, of course, some smart ways of finding minimum of functions of several variables. It's called f min search. And it's not a gradient method. So pretty much all the gradient methods that we've, we've talked about were you know, gradient methods, where you either went to the steepest descent or conjugate gradient, all of that, right? But he, he did need the gradient to, and that was part of also the stopping criterion. But it, it was actually part of the uh, computation that he had to grade, have the gradient in some fashion. Well, in situations like this where you don't have a, a good, good, um, you know, or an efficient way to kind of write the gradient in the code, um, there is this implementation of a search method of a, of a minimization problem called fmin search you can you can look at the uh, help on that um, I also have a link here to what's called a Nelder Mead algorithm which basically is is what that fmin search problem is so let me I, I made a link to the um, to the Wikipedia because that's I, I found that to be kind of the easiest to follow but um, so numerical implementation uh, without requiring uh, the gradient of a function of several variables is uh, using the Nelder Mead algorithm. And we haven't talked about it, like what it does, so I'm not going to um, go into the details. Just to say that, you know, you read that it's actually based on the simplex method, uh, which is a little bit misleading because it's not really the simplex method that you've learned. It's uh, Instead, is the following. Mm, it's kind of a search. I don't know if you can see this. In two dimensions, they talk about, well, um, I guess it is a simplex. A simplex in two dimensions is a triangle, right? I mean, it could be more complicated, but that's why it's a little bit different. Um, it's sort of a starting with an initial triangle in the plane, um, computing like the worst vertex, like the highest value of the, f of the function on the vertex, and discarding that vertex and kind of moving to a new triangle. Okay. And how you do this, I think it's also called uh, Mead, uh, amoeba, uh, uh, I'm sorry, amoeba, amoeba, amoeba. Uh, method because the triangle kind of kind of changes shape, changes location, um, and it's a very interesting, a very interesting um, method. So it really uses the simplex as being uh, n plus one vertices in n dimensions, and that's. That's the object that kind of changes um, at every iteration. Um, let's see, this is another. It's called Himmelbau function. You can see kind of how the triangle kind of 
moves towards a minimum and it will the algorithm stops when the simplex has a size you know less than a prescribed one and of course you have the problem that you actually search you know a local minimizer not, not you don't know it's a global minimizer but this doesn't I mean and I haven't I, I haven't shown you how the, the the change you know the algorithm really works but it doesn't require a kind of a gradient computation um, <coughs> By the way, I, I failed to, to, to tell you this. What's the banana function? <laughs> banana function is, is uh, very similar to that problem number 10 in, your, in the homework that I just returned to you uh, with the 100 factor. Um, but it's not, the 100 is in the wrong place. So it should be in the uh, multi. So banana function is that function with 100 in the first term rather than the second term. Um, so, anyway, that's these are kind of uh, benchmark functions where um, you you kind of try the algorithm, you know, kind of compare speeds and all that. Um, yeah. So in your case, it was really kind of long this way. Here is is not uh, not as long. Okay. So, you know, that's that's our black box basically tool. Um, and let me go to the, the the code really kind of it's I mean everything below this is just plotting. The code is just just that. You say you start with an initial point. Okay, so forget triangles and all that. Just, you know, you're back to an initial guess. And my guess is I just picked one. I mean, I said, you know, let's start with, since it's one at the end point, it doesn't matter though. Well, it does, but not in this case. Um, so I just pick with a string of ones. And you just uh, do this. You apply this. And here you have to call the function. So you, have, you still have to define the function. Uh, and I call it discrete, so I'll show you how the, the discrete function looks like. So again, the discrete function says it's a function, the MATLAB, so you, you have an input and an output, right? <clears throat> so as the input, it basically tells, uh, uh, it brings whatever it, it was sent from that main code, right? So we had 20, it was a 20 uh, co column vector. 20 dimensional column vector, right? 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. So what happens is, is it takes that, it adds, you know, x naught and xn plus 1, those values being always 1, and ignore this for a second. Here it just kind of gets the size, just so that it uses it in the code here. And that's a kind of a smart, and it's not smart because it's me, but I was, I was actually clued in. Uh, to uh, code that summation as you know xj plus one. I mean it should be uj uj plus one minus uj squared one over m plus one squared uh, times that average uj plus one plus uj over two times m plus one. Now we don't see uj plus one and uj here. And you don't see a loop either. Right? You could make this into a loop for j from 1 to n, or from j from 0 to n plus 1. But instead, what you can do in MATLAB is you can actually truncate that vector, chop the first one, and then chop the last one. This way, you get a 21 dimensional vectors, right? But one is shifted compared to the other. So when you do this subtraction here, you actually it hits. The, the j plus 1th and the jth component. Okay, so that's just a, but that's it. So that's all it does, and let's run this. Um, 
I'm sorry. I should have closed all of them before. Okay. That is U. That's the optimal. Well, that's the approximate optimal U. Um, when you run this code, unless you kind of you know hide the, the results, when you do fmin search, it's going to show you all the iterations it goes through. And this is the last one here. So it's remember these are the interior points. So this is very close to one, and then goes down, right? Goes down, down, down. Well, of course, the picture shows shows this better. So these are just the values at those 20 points. Okay. And you can see that it's not too low. I mean, the other picture was just sort of showing you the um, surface of rotation. But this is all done numerically, so this is not a cosine hyperbolic. Still, it is an approximation for the cosine hyperbolic um, for the catenary curve. OK? Um, It would actually be interesting to run this when they are f far apart, like 1.5, not just 1. Or 2, let's say 2 apart. Right? When they're 1 apart, it means that halfway is 0.5. That's within that range, right? But let's, now if you kind of uh, make them um, apart, move them apart, Let's see if we can change it really quick. Nothing here, right? Just in the function itself. So how do you change that discretizing, let's say, from 0 to 2? That's going to be a huge departure from. Um, you have the interval from 0 to 2 to discretize rather than from 0 to 1, right? So all you have to change is dx dx was 1 over n plus 1. Now it should be 2 over n plus 1, or 1.5 over n plus 1. Let me, let me say b, so this is 1.5. Right? So this would be 1 over, or n plus 1 over b. That's dx, right? dx is b over n plus 1. b is the end point from 0 to b. And also here, times b. OK? So I don't know, let's change it from not, not 1.5, so see, see it works for b equals 1.2. That is our still kind of a minimal surface. So I'm going to save this, and let's run this again. Okay. So we've gotten the, a narrower middle, right? It's a thinner surface. Uh, somehow the plot is still from 0 to 1, so that's, that I should have changed. You see I'm plotting from 0 to 1, so that's not... Uh, and here, plotting from 0 to 1, so I should put B. B. And there is a way to, to kind of... Uh, this is in the main code. You should actually send the value B and the... In the uh, in the function as as well, but I'm just going to change it like this. Axis. Let's see if that change anything. Um, oh yeah. Well, you don't see it in this, but you should see it in the other one. Oh yeah, this one. Hmm? Yeah, you have to change the surf. So let's not look at the. Let's just look at the U. Okay, let's just U. Uh, from zero to one point two. Now let's 
change this so since we know this is not going to come up nice let me just comment it just want to see you before before we um, rotate it and let's change this to 1.4 Oops, just save it first. I found a minimum. So what's the problem? In the continuous case, we know there is no minimum. There's no optimal solution, right? When you discardize, you, you basically just changing that tr threshold. I mean, if you make it big enough, like two, then I'm pretty sure that's. I haven't tried that, um, of course, but. The other problem is the number of discretization points, right? You, if you, you could increase that and see what happens, but um, I think we should stop playing. Okay. The nice thing, this code will 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 take now. You know, will basically find the minimum in the space of 50, 50 variables. It's already exiting. So that search has has failed to um, maximum number of function evaluations has been exceeded. Um, yeah. So this would be kind of fifty fifty dimensional. The last last uh, the last. Um, search, the last point of the search before some sort of error um, appeared. So, so sort of what's the moral here? If the continuous problem has a minimum, there's a good likelihood that the approximations, you know, with n large enough, will, 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 um, will approximate that minimum, right? But if the problem doesn't have a minimum, then the approximation actually just shows you some, you know, may, may not have sort of, I mean, will not approximate something that doesn't exist, right? So it will be sort of a different animal there. Um, so somehow you've got to make sure that you have a minimum before you try to approximate. Um, anyway, this is kind of something good to keep in mind. Of course, you always would like to use black box tool so just just use fmin search from now on right <laughs> um, you don't have to like you have to deal with conjugate gradients you have to deal with anything but um, uh, you and again this this has nothing to do with the fact that we use the fmin search. I mean, we could have used the steepest descent. Um, most likely, we would have gotten something. Um, abnormal. Yeah, by either method. Okay. So, uh, note that um, one needs to uh, determine First, that the continuous problem, a variational problem, has an optimal solution prior to attempting to approximate it. OK. 
Okay. So, you know, in a way, you still need to figure out, you know, uh, things uh, by hand before you can. I mean, this approximation takes takes the the burden of actually solving the Euler Lagrange equation, right? But setting up the Lagrange equation, the Euler Lagrange equation, and, and kind of looking at, you know, convexity properties, all of this is still kind of essential. Um, I would like to, you know, just point to there's there's this exercise number 17 here. Um, which on page 194 which basically talks about discretizing the brachiostochron uh, uh, problem, so minimizing the integral from 0 to 1, square root of 1 plus u prime of x squared over the square root of x dx, u of 0 is 0, u of 1 is negative 1. Um, you know how it should look like, right? Well, starts here and at 1 is negative 1. So, and you should get, you know, the picture in the discrete case should look similar. Of course, if you use, I don't know, five or more points, so you don't see a broken... Of course, you would see a broken line if it's a very few points, but um, how would you discretize this? Well, it's easier. You don't have u, so you don't, you don't have to put anything for u. It's just that squared expression divided by 1 over square root of x. That's, that would be j... Okay, so... So xj is j over n plus 1, right? right? How do you describe uh, the point between 0 and 1, n plus 1 subintervals? It means xj is j over n plus 1. So that's to the part, the square root is going to enter that discrete functional function, right? And the code, how does that change? Probably you can you can uh, get away again without um, having to do a loop, but in the, the in the function where you define the function here, so this part is the same, right? And then instead of multiply by u, you divide by the square root of x. So I'll let you practice your already. Uh, strong MATLAB skills here to kind of replace this and get that shape, you know. I mean, I'm not going to take it, put it as a homework, just, just point out as, a, as an exercise if you'd like to kind of understand this a little bit better. And finally, um, I want to remind you that problem from the Um, a homework, previous homework, which was the discretization of, of this variational problem. If you minimize the derivative of u squared over the admissible paths, zero, I mean 1 at 0 and 0 at 1, What's the solution in the for the continuous problem? Well, if you do the Euler Lagrange, I think you've done this by now. You'll get right. The derivative with respect to u prime is just two u prime, and that's another derivative with respect to x. So that's u double prime equals zero. U of zero is one. U of one is zero. So u ends up looking like uh, 
right? Starter one uh, goes linearly down to zero. Well, if you if write a discretization problem, you should be getting this this particular shape. Um, so the discretize function functional will be the f how will it be? Well, it would be. Summation of n plus 1 squared, uj plus 1 minus uj squared, j from 0 to n, with u0 is 1 and un plus 1 is 1, is 0, right? And if you kind of ignore the n plus 1, that's irrelevant, right? This is going to be. u1 minus 1 squared plus summation from 1 to n minus 1 uj plus 1 minus uj plus un squared. That's exactly um, that problem where problem 3, page 107. Exercise 3, page 107. Now, um, what we haven't talked, and we'll, we'll take a break. Um, well, we, what we haven't talked about is how do you discretize actually problems that have constraints, uh, variational problems that have constraints, like equality constraints. So, variational problems with equality constraints, integral constraints. So if I have something like, let's say, u of x an integral is, is 1 now, for instance, right? Then the discrete version is summation of uj from 0 to n times, I'm sorry, dx, times n plus 1, 1 over n plus 1 equals 1. So this means that the summation of u, uh, uj's has to be um, a fixed number, right? So that would be uh, constraint optimization in in Rn, where you have to minimize you know the discrete version of the functional subject to I guess from 1 to n. Okay, and again, how do you use f min search, or how do you how do you do this? I mean, normally you'd have to do Lagrange multiplier. You have to do um, <clears throat> gradients, right? You have to say the grain of this plus lambda grain of this equals zero. You would convert it into, into an unconstrained optimization, but uh, then find whatever the lambda, the corresponding uh, Lagrange multiplier is. So um, I'll, leave it, I'll leave this for now. I mean, it's, it's basically the last section in the chapter of approximation techniques that we haven't covered, which is how do you um, numerically do you know, constraint optimization problems in Rn? Um, and if I have time, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it for, for Wednesday to, um, to show you this, right? If you have a 20-dimensional 20, 20 20 minimization problem with constraints, 
how do you actually do this numerically? That's something that you know you'd have to kind of combine fmin search um, for an unconstrained problem. You have to kind of convert this to an unconstrained problem, um, and that's using Lagrange multipliers technique. So I, I'll show you the code, but um, just back to that homework problem. Remember, there was one one thing was to optimize unconstrained optimization. In another uh, point of that problem was using some constraints, right? And um, turns out that those constraints were coming from, so say, um, if the constraints look like this, a to the i u j, a to the j u j, if this was a constant, where a is a constant, where is this coming from? Is the discrete version uh, what integral constraint? Can somebody tell me? What 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 expression discretize gives you that? A to the x. Because what do we say? X turns into no, not a. Uh, a to the well, it's not. It's not a. It's a to the a tilde. Okay. It's a different A that, than that A, and it's a different C than that C here. Okay. Think about discretizing this with, the, with that procedure. You're going to get J over N plus 1. So it will be like the nth root of N plus 1th root of, of A tilde is A. And then here it would be dx is 1 over n plus 1, so that will be c tilde times n plus 1 is c, right? So then, then the question is, um, the continuous variation problem would be minimizing the integral from 0 to 1 u prime of x squared sub, um, under the restriction u of 0 is 1, u of 1 is 0, an integral of zero to 1 of this is c. Okay. And now you have the tools to actually solve this continuous variation problem. Yeah. And kind of go back there. If A was 1, does anybody remember what was that uh, shape that we got in that problem? Parabolic. So if A is 1, you just have an integral of U is constant. And with the minimization of the U prime square, if you do that over Lagrange, you get that U has to be quadratic. So it's a parabolic. It's a parabolic shape with this going through these two points. Okay. So it matches. It matches uh, the discrete version of this. Sort of match is the approximate optimal for the con uh, optimal of the continuous problem. Okay. So in many in many respects, of course, it's hard to say, but uh, how to compare the two. But in many respects, the continuous problem is easier. Conceptually, it's easier than this discretized version. The discretized version, you have no clue where it's coming from, or what is it, the meaning of that. Okay. 
All right, so let's take a 10-minute break, and then we'll, we'll start um, talking about chapter, chapter 6.